to. Okay. Welcome everyone. After a while, we're trying to uh, bring the seminar back to its regular schedule. And I'm very glad to announce that our first speaker of the year is David Ellerman, whom many of you know because he's a regular visitor here. Actually, David now lives in Shishka. So we hope to see him more often. Um, David, it's all yours. Okay, let me share a screen here. Oh, somebody said that Egbert already was this year. That's true. Sorry, Egbert, you were the first this year. I, I can be the zero speaker. You're the zero. Uh, there we go. Egbert was the zero, and David is the first. Good save, Dave. Good save, Egbert. If you uh, count floors the way we do here, you start at zero, it seems. Yep, and they, 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 they even go to negative, so. I can't seem to get it bigger. Uh, um, full screen. Minus two is the button. What? I said that minus two is the button. Oh, so you go to, uh, I think it's something like control L if this is Acrobat Reader. I tried that. It's an Acrobat. Yeah, full screen mode. There we go. Yep. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so the um, talk today is trying to analyze using the concepts of elements and distinctions, which I'll explain in a minute, uh, basically what goes on in the category of sets. And uh, so the what I'm trying to explain is much broader, but I'll focus on explaining uh, can canonical maps, where they come from, so a theory of canonicity. And, um, and then you'll see how duality, morphisms, universal constructions, everything come out of this analysis. So um, that's the general scope of the talk. And I want to start by sort of saying how all this came about. And the analysis uses this uh, interplay between uh, the Boolean subset lattice and the lattice of partitions. And uh, the lattice of, of uh, subsets or Boolean logic was developed in the 19th century. And uh, the, the lattice of partitions was also developed in the 19th century. It was known to Dedekin and uh, Schroeder and others, and, uh, but they only had the operations of join and meet, the two lattice theoretic operations on partitions. And throughout the 20th century, there were no new operations on partitions defined. Uh, reasons, I'm not sure. So uh, to define the logic of partitions as being dual uh, to the logic of subsets, uh, one needs to define implication and so forth. And so uh, that was first published in 2010, as, as you see here. And then um, the trick was to, how do you find the other logical operations, all the Boolean operations on partitions? And, and uh, so I, I um, singled out the method used in the original paper. And uh, this was published in the Slovene journal, Adam which I think is published out of uh, Potoros. And uh, so that's where this got started. And so you have these two logics. You've got the logic of subsets and logic of partitions. So what are the basic uh, elements when you get to the quantitative version? And Boolean logic has a quantitative version, namely finite probability theory. So it's just the cardinality of subsets over the universe set. And this of course is in Boole, Boole's original book on the laws of thought. It goes into probability theory as well as uh, the logic itself. So probability of, a, of an event is just the normalized number of elements. And I'm gonna call also elements its as opposed to dits. And, and uh, so we have two terminologies here. So the question was, uh, what's the quantitative version of the logic of partitions? And uh, 
the notion of distinctions, which are just a pair of, it's an ordered pair of elements in different blocks of the partition. So just to recall, partition is a set of subsets of the universe, which are disjoint and mutually uh, exhaust their union as the whole universe U. So uh, a pair of elements in different blocks are a pair of elements in the universe that have been distinguished by that partition. And that's what partitions do is they distinguish things. And uh, so that gives you a notion of information. Uh, logical entropy is just this ratio, the number of dits uh, in a partition normalized by the, since the dits in order pair, you normalize it by the Cartesian product here. And that's published um, 2017 in this logical information theory, new foundations for information theory. So my mentor in mathematics was uh, Giancarlo Rota. And uh, he always had this vision that probability is to sets as information is to partitions. And uh, so this is what I was in effect trying to develop uh, after he died in 1999, then various of his uh, co-workers uh, tried to extend a lot of his work. And so this is what I, what got me into uh, developing the logic of partitions. So uh, Giancarlo says probability is a measure on the Boolean algebra of events. It's uh, quantitatively the idea of a size of a set, which is the number of elements. So what is the corresponding notion for partitions as size is to sets? And basically the answer is, uh, well, he says, how do you find the answer? It it's, should be a measure of information provided by a random variable, in particular by the inverse image of the random variable partition of the sample space. So this is from Rota's Fubini lectures. And the answer is that a distinction of a partition is the corresponding thing to an element of a subset. So the sort of logical notion of information, logical entropy is just the number of distinctions normalized in this way. And this is a measure in the sense of measure theory. It's a probability measure. In fact, it's just the, this logical information is the uh, probability that in two independent draws, you get a distinction. Uh, two independent draws from the universe, you'll get a distinction of this partition. And uh, this is also analogous to the probability, which is, of course, the probability of getting an element of S in one random draw. So uh, when you mention information theory, people say, well, what's the relationship to Shannon's entropy? And Shannon's entropy is not a measure, but it's obtained by a certain nonlinear transformation of logical entropy. And, and uh, so uh, you have, you often see in information theoretic books, these Venn diagrams uh, for different, the Shannon entropy, the conditional, the joint, and the mutual uh, entropy. And, uh, but it's not a measure in, in the sense of measure theory. So the, whereas logical entry is, and this transformation preserves Venn diagrams. So that's sort of how Shannon entropy satisfies the Venn diagrams. So this is uh, where I started out, was with this analysis seen that elements of subsets and distinctions of partitions are these two sort of dual concepts. So let's try to apply it to category theory. Start with the category of sets, which is not just a random category. It's sort of the, what Germans would call the Ur category, the category where things originally got started and then were generalized to abstract, uh, to concrete categories and then more abstract categories. So, Let's start off with the notion of morphism. How does this give us an analysis of the notion of morphisms in the category of sets? Morphisms mean just functions. So you define uh, in sort of the obvious way, a binary relation transmits elements for every, if every element in your X here, there's an ordered pair for some Y. And then reflex elements is the other way around. And then binary relation transmits or preserves distinctions if for every pair in the relation, if the X is distinguished, then the Y has to be distinguished and vice versa, reflects distinctions if the other way around. If the two ordered pairs are in the relation and if the Y is distinguished, then the X's have to be distinguished. So that reflects distinctions. So 
when you say, well, how is a function usually defined? It's characterized as being this sort of binary relation that's everywhere, defined everywhere in single value. But that being defined everywhere just means it transmits elements and being single valued means it reflects distinctions. So you can define a binary relation as a, as a function if it transmits elements and reflects distinctions. That leaves you then say, well, what about the other two notions of transmitting distinctions or reflecting elements? And those are of course, just the other two related notions that transmitting distinctions means injective, reflecting elements just means surjective. So this elements and distinction conceptual language is the natural language in which to define the morphisms in the category of sets. And, and a lot of the other stuff will come out of these basic definitions of, of the functions there. So now let's turn to duality. So the, the title here is duality, just interchange elements and distinctions. So if you were to use the old definition of function as a re relation everywhere defined in single value, that gives you no hint of duality. But if you define it the right way, then, then the, the duality merges naturally, just interchange elements and distinctions. Or equivalently, interchange reflects uh, and preserves. So if we interchange the roles of elements and distinctions in a function, that gives us a, I think would be called a co-function, uh, which is a subset of the binary relation y cross x. And this means that actually in the category of the opposite of sets, there, there are concrete morphisms. That normally we, we think of the morphisms in the dual sort of this abstract notion that relates back to sets, but there actually uh, is, is a special type of binary relation that is a co-function and it preserves distinctions rather than elements and it reflects elements rather than distinctions. So we have uh, sort of the explanation coming out of this, these atomic concepts, elements and distinctions of where duality comes from in the category of sets. And uh, so then I just go explain this a little bit. And then uh, as we get on to the universal constructions, they, they all involve the sort of interchange between elements and distinctions products and co-products, equalizers and co-equalizers, and in general, limits and co-limits. So this is how things, I will go into some of the details later, but this is how these atomic notions of elements and distinctions uh, work in the category sets. And then you generalize first to concrete categories, uh, categories which have an underlying set functor, and then uh, reverse, reverse the arrows as abstractly used to define uh, duality in abstract categories where you don't have sets around. So that's sort of the theme here. That's how, how we're doing it. We're, we're trying to show how these two notions of elements and distinctions are the atoms, as, conceptual atoms, as it were, to build up the morphisms, the notion of duality. And now we'll turn to some <clears throat> uh, defining canonicity. So we all know the category theory started out with the uh, definition of naturality. In fact, it's interesting that the original article by uh, McLean Eilenberg had no notion of, of universal constructions. It was just the theory of naturality. And uh, then the universal constructions came along a few years later. So, but there is no uh, rigorous definition of canonicity. And so it's my purpose to use this elements and distinctions analysis and the two basic lattices, subsets and partitions to define canonicity. So the problem of defining canonicity was raised here by Jean-Pierre Marquis, uh, who's a sort of philosopher, mathematician. And uh, he, he didn't give a theory, he gave the intuitive idea he said that it's, it's, these are maps, canonical maps, a map defined without any arbitrary decision. But he did define some criteria. And these are his, this is a quote from his paper, defining the criteria that, that uh, and he defined it for limits. And so you dualize and you got the same criteria for co-limits. Morphisms that are part of the definition of a limit, like the projection morphisms for the product, those are canonical. So that has to be explained. 
and the uh, universal mapping property morphisms uh, from the cone to the limit is, is, is another example of intuitively a canonical morphism. So that has to be explained and that's what I'll do here. And, and the last thing here is the unique isomorphism between two candidates for a limit. And that's actually a special case of two here that, that uh, when you have two candidates that are gonna be then use the universal property for each one and you get that they're canonically isomorphic. So, um, so the theory of canonicity is, well, the canonical maps are the ones that reach back and use the, the two lattices, the two behind the two logics. So the, particularly the partial orders in the two, the two lattices. So the Boolean lattice is the partial order is the inclusion and that obviously induces the canonical uh, insertion injection here. So more subtle is the partition lattice. So the partition lattice, all, all the partitions on some universe uh, U is uh, refinement and uh, the uh, symbolized like this. So we say that, that sigma is the coarser partition and, and pi is the more refined partition. But this, this turns out to be just equivalent to inclusion, this inclusion up here of distinctions, if you wish. But the original definition, it says that for every block in the more refined partition, there is a block in the coarser partition that contains the block of the uh, more refined partition. So that means that you have a canonical map defined from pi, because pi is just a set of blocks, b, sigma is just a set of blocks C. So for every block B, it's contained in a unique block of C. So you have a, a surjection defined here. So you have an injection defined up here by the partial order. You have a surjection defined down here by the partial order. And the theory is that all canonical maps in category of sets arise from these two partial order induced maps. And that's what we need to do. To prove. So that's the theory here, is they arise from these partial order induced maps <clears throat> spelled out here. So, uh, and, and just one, one small point here is that the things are a little more complicated in the partition case, as you know, in general, co limits are more complicated than limits. So, because uh, the, because the, the, uh, the map there is defined between the blocks of a partition, but we want a map down on certain sets. And so we have to use two natural isomorphisms here. So the image of a function, take a function of x to y, the image is naturally isomorphic to the co-image, the co-image being the, the set of blocks uh, in the inverse image for each y in the, in the image. And an even simpler case is the discrete partition. This is the top of the of the partition lattice where uh, every block is just a singleton is naturally isomorphic uh, to U itself. So we need these two uh, natural isomorphisms to pull our, our partial order defined maps down to the, the sets where we need them in, in uh, treating the co-equalizer or the co-product. So- David, can I just ask- uh, Give me a ask criteria. a question? Sure. Uh, this line with f of x, how am I reading this? So you have f of x is isomorphic to f to the minus one. Yeah, that's just the inverse image, partition. Okay, I have to think in terms of partitions here. Right. So I have a map from x to y or is f? No, you have a map from the blocks in this partition. Ah, okay, okay. Y. Okay. Y is... Okay, so it's between the blocks. Okay, thank you. That's what I was missing. Thanks. Yeah, one to one and on to. <clears throat> and it's natural. Uh, you can several ways you can find nice functors to make it make it natural. So that's uh, where we're starting. So let's uh, start off with some of the more elementary concepts: uh, terminal logic, neutral logic, epimono factorization. So, <clears throat> so in the given a partition on U it's refined by the top of the lattice, obviously, and that's called the discrete partition, as I said, the one of singletons. So every other partition pi is refined by U. So that means you're always gonna have a 
partial order induce the natural uh, or map from you or from the blocks of this, but that's isomorphic to you to pi. Take each singleton to the unique block that contains that, that element. And the bottom of the partition lattice called the indiscrete partition is just the one where the whole universe is the single block. And uh, it's refined by all partitions. So zero is, is refined in particular by, by the discrete partition at the top. And uh, so you have, U is naturally isomorphic to the discrete partition. So you get this induced map down to the, uh, this indiscrete partition, which is naturally isomorphic to one, the one element set. So that means that for any, take U to be any set, there's a canonical map from U to one. And it's a surjection if U is not empty. And, and uh, that's, uh, that means that one is the terminology. So we have from this, these induced maps, we get the map that makes uh, one into the terminologic in sets. So then we go on to the initial laundry. <clears throat> so the top of the Boolean uh, lattice is U. So every subset, uh, you have a canonical uh, injection into U and the bottom of the subset lattice is the empty set. So we have U, uh, the null set contained in, in U. So there's a canonical injection here for any U uh, and that makes the empty set into the initial object. So we have explanations of the terminal logic and the initial object all going back to these canonically defined, these partial order defined uh, functions in the, in the uh, partition lattice for the terminal logic and in the, the uh, subset lattice for the initial object. And so this is just a little summary here Subset logic, you have the elements U of, of a subset. Partition logic, you have the distinctions of pi. So where U and U prime are different blocks of pi. Inclusion is inclusion of elements and refinement is just inclusion of distinctions or the more complicated definition I gave before. So the canonical maps where you have inclusion is injection here and surjection here. And the extremal logics are the empty set because that's contained in every U and the, the, uh, in this, in the, the, uh, this refinement, which, and this is isomorphic to one, this is isomorphic to U. So you have the maps here from U to one, which makes one into the terminology. So that's starting out. Then we move to the epimono factorization. So we have a function Co-image is this inverse image uh, partition here, and the image is the usual thing. So <clears throat> this uh, inverse image partition is always defined by the top of the lattice. So you're always going to have a induced map from X, which is isomorphic to the uh, discrete partition, to F inverse, which is isomorphic here. So that gives you the the uh, map, the canonical map from X to F of X, which is the, the uh, epi part of the epi mono factorization. And then you go the other way. The, the image is contained here. So you have the canonical injection directly here. So that gives you your epi mono uh, factorization, both being induced by partial order uh, in the partition lattice in this case, and then the, the Boolean lattice, subset lattice in this case. So that, that's the beginning of just giving us the couple of the uh, universal objects in, in category sets and the epimodal factorization. So let's now uh, go to co-equalizers. And, and uh, the, the uh, data here that we're given is two parallel maps from X to Y. And uh, so we start off defining this uh, partition on Y. Given every X, we got a pair of elements of Y. And then we, we generate the, the uh, smallest equivalence relation that equates F of X and G of X for all X in, in the domain. So that gives us a equivalence relation, which I will call tilde here, is, is the equivalence relation. And the co-equalizer 
is just the, the um, quotient set here. So tilde, the elements of tilde are uh, blocks in a partition. And when you take the quotient set, it's, it's uh, there the elements are single elements, but you can think of them if you wish as in effect the blocks in, in the partition uh, tilde. So uh, as usual, <clears throat> the, the uh, uh, tilde being a partition on Y is refined by the discrete partition on Y and that gives you the canonical surjection from Y isomorphic to the discrete to tilde, which is isomorphic to the, to the quotient set. So that gives you uh, your canonical map. And then turning to the universal mapping property. So suppose we have another function, oops, H, like might as well use the diagram. So we have another function H here so that the two compositions are the same then the universal mapping property is there exists a unique H uh, star here that makes the triangle commute. So we already have a partition on Y, namely the one generated by the, this F of X being set equal to G of X. So that's the partition tilde. And we have this fact that the composing F and G with H gives the same map means that this co-image of H has to at least identify F of X and G of X. Otherwise, they wouldn't commute. Otherwise, these two things wouldn't be the same. So that means that the inverse image of H at least identifies those things. So it's a coarser partition than tilde. Because tilde is the minimal one that identifies F of X and G of X. OK, it's a coarser partition. So that means you've got a, uh, your, your partition lattice gives you a map from the blocks of tilde to the blocks of H inverse. And spelling that out uh, for each element in, in each block in tilde means an element in the quotient set. Uh, there's a unique block here containing it. So you have this induced map from the block to the Z here and which takes the quotient set to this image. And you put it all together. So you got your H star is here's your natural isomorphism between the quotient set and the partition making that quotient set partial order defined map because H we saw that H inverse the inverse image was coarser than tilde had to define the two things that define tilde and it could define more things and that's isomorphic to its image which is contained in Z so you put it all together and that gives you your factor map so that this works so that's the analysis of how the canonical map here and the canonical map here, H star, both arise by these, by these induced maps in the partition lattice. And of course, you turn it around and you get the same uh, thing for equalizers, except now you're using maps from the subset lattice. So you got the same, oops. got the same <coughs> data here and and uh, but now you you work the other way you say equalizer is all the x where the two maps uh, have the same element in the in the codomain so <coughs> that gives you a a uh, subset and that gives you a canonical injection uh, from the subset lattice trivially and the universal mapping property says suppose you have some uh, z function into x so that the two compositions are the same. Then we need to show there's a unique h sub star here that makes the triangle commute. And it's, and it's the same story that because these two commute, it means that the whole image of h has to be contained here because when you, when you follow any element in the image, it gives you the same thing in y. And, and so, <clears throat> image must satisfy this. So all the elements uh, in that image, uh, they have to, F and G have to agree on them. So, so this image is contained in the equalizer. And you just put that together, you get the H substar here. So this universal mapping property uses the subset lattice just dually to the way the other universal mapping property of the co-equalizer used the partition lattice. Okay, so 
that that handles the the explanation of co-equalizers and equalizers. So we now we want to turn to co-products and products. So have you ever thought what's so special about the co-product and product? I mean, where do these come? We, we all know they have these properties, the universal mapping properties and so forth, but where do they come from? And, and uh, the answer is the, you're given two sets, that's your data. So what is the set that has the maximum number of elements? Remember we're analyzing in terms of elements and distinctions that you can get starting with X and Y. And that turns out to be the disjoint union. So even if they overlap, you want the maximum number of elements treating even the overlap as being distinct in the two sets. And we'll see in the next slide or so, what's the maximum number of distinctions, these ordered pairs you can get given two sets. And that of course is the Cartesian product, the two sets, which is the product. So the notion of co-product and product arise very naturally from the data, two sets, and getting the maximum number of elements and the maximum number of distinctions. And that maximality then gives you uh, the, the, the various properties. So even if X and Y overlap, or even if they're equal, we make a copy of Y as Y star, and then we define the disjoint union as a union of X and, and Y star. We have the inclusions uh, here, so that gives us the canonical injections from the subset lattice. And from the universal mapping property, we, we, uh, we have a, a co-cone, uh, a map from X to some Z and G to the same Z. We want to show there's a unique factor map from the disjoint union to Z so that the triangles commute in this picture here. So <clears throat> how do we use the data? Well, one of, the, one of the, the given things is this F here. So that gives us a partition on X, the inverse image. G gives us a partition G inverse on Y. And here we have the disjoint union. So we, we can put the two uh, partitions together and will give us a partition, disjoint union of the partition on the disjoint union sets. And we wanna then uh, define this, this factor map here so that partition on the disjoint union is, of course, refined by the, by the uh, discrete partition of the disjoint union. So that means we're going to have a map from each element of the disjoint union to here. <clears throat> so each element of the disjoint union, there's a unique block of the form inverse image of Z or uh, G inverse of Z, because that's how we formed the, this this, this uh, uh, partition of the disjoint union was putting together. So each, each uh, element has to belong to one of these. And, and then you define this function as, as, as uh, taking that element to the appropriate Z, whether it's uh, Z that gave you F of X, F inverse of Z or G inverse of Z. And that's the map that is then your, your canonical map from the disjoint union to this, which is contained in Z. And so you put it all together and you get your, your factor map here that, that makes these things commute. So uh, in this construction, we use both the, to get the canonical maps here, we use the subset lattice. And the, to get the canonical map here, we use the partition lattice. And same, same thing, but reversed, of course, for the product. So let's go to the product. So the co-product is the maximum number of elements and the product is the maximum number of distinctions you get from two sets. And we usually construct it just taking the set of ordered pairs here, but just let's just emphasize the point. Let's do another construction of the product in category of sets. So let's do this trick of where we, we, uh, we mark each element of Y and then we form this set of ordered pairs, of unordered pairs, <clears throat> X, Y star for every X in X and every Y star in Y star. And so this would be uh, what it was if you're taking the Cartesian product itself. So this construction is isomorphic to the usual construction, just shows that with the real thing here is you wanna get the maximum number of uh, pairs of elements 
even even unordered pairs in this case uh, that will you can get from two sets. So now we we go on just going back to the original construction of the product Cartesian product here. Uh, we have blocks defined on this. So the block defined by an element of y, uh, yeah, of a, excuse me, an element of x is singleton x cross y. And then we have block uh, by of all these elements, which is singleton y here. So this gives us two different partitions of x cross y. So if you've got two partitions and they, they are uh, both obviously uh, going to be refined by the discrete partition of x cross y, then you have your canonical maps, which are surjections if x and y are not empty. <clears throat> And, and uh, that gives you your projections. So the induced maps, then x cross y is isomorphic to the discrete partition, gives you your induced map to pi x, which is isomorphic to x. And similarly, the projection to y is here, your induced map to pi sub y is isomorphic to y. So that gives you two projections are both induced by the partition lattice in this case. And then we go to the universal mapping property <clears throat> for the products, you start with a cone. You've got two functions from a common domain to X and, and a common domain to Y. We want to show there's a unique map here. And, and uh, I'm using this notation for this unique map. And uh, so <clears throat> the data are these two, uh, these two maps that make up the cone and we need to canonically construct this factor map here. So F contributes this co-image uh, partition on, on, uh, on Z and, and G contributes the co-image partition on Z as well. So if you've got two partitions on Z, then in the lattice, you take their join. So the join is the all the non-empty overlaps of blocks. So you've got two partitions on the same set and wherever the blocks over, the blocks of each partition don't overlap each other, but they can overlap the blocks of the other partition. So you take the join, it's just all the, the uh, non-empty overlaps here. So all the overlaps have this form. They're F inverse of some X intersect G inverse of, of some Y. So we wanted to find this function from Z to here. Well. The discrete partition refines this partition, this joint partition. So every singleton, each element of Z, there's a unique block of the form F inverse X intersection G inverse Y that contains Z. So there's your map. It goes from Z to the X and Y. And, and that's contained here. And, and so you have it, put these maps together and you have then your canonical map here that that makes, gives you this commutativity. So we've shown how the, the, um, all these canonical maps, the, the, the projections here and the canonical map here are all defined going back to these two lattices of subsets or lattices of partitions and using the induced maps by the partial orders uh, to define them. And so we've done that for products and equalizers and co-products and co-equalizers, and you know that suffices to define all limits and co-limits. So basically we have the uh, theory of canonicity uh, automatically extends to all limits and co-limits. And, and uh, in the underlying paper that you can download from my website, I, I do a lot more cases, do, do the, uh, um, the, the pullback and push out and another example that, that uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Marquis suggested and, and show how the theory works for all of them as well. So- uh, David, can I ask a question? Sure. So are you talking about finite limits and co-limits here or, or also infinite ones? Because I mean, your analysis was, looked quite finitary about of, of products. Yeah, yeah, I, I did the finite. Will problems arise in the in the? I don't know. That's why. That's why I'm asking. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I do the usual, uh, just 
products and co-products, and that should get all finite products and all finite co-products. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now I'm just wondering whether sort of characterizing the, the maps involved in products um, via distinctions, um, if you go to infinite products, whether that, how easy that is. Um, but anyway, something to think. think. <laughs> yes, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't really thought about it. I mean, certainly the partitions work fine. Um, and the subsets work fine in the two lattices are complete and co-complete. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so that's, so the logical, when we say the logical theory of canonicity here, we're referring to these two mathematical logics, which sort of have equal interplay uh, in this analysis, equal intertwining roles <clears throat> and, and, uh, uh, What's interesting here is that, you know, I started out uh, using the standard category theoretic fact that partitions are dual to subsets. And uh, when I was developing the logic of partitions, dual to the logic of subsets, but at, at the end of the day, it's the other way around. It, it's that we define duality in the category sets using elements and distinctions. And, and uh, so, uh, I would claim this theory here is not only a theory of canonicity, but it's also uh, using the elements and distinctions we see uh, why the, you build up morphisms defining this and then you interchange the role of elements and distinctions and you get exactly turning around the maps in, in, in the uh, category sets to its dual. And then you abstract all that to general category theory where you don't have underlying sets and you just have the turn around the arrows uh, notion. So in that sense, these concepts, uh, duality comes out of elements and distinctions uh, rather than the other way around. But that's, that's I mean, it's a, it's a chicken and egg problem if you, if you wish uh, to think of it in, in that way. So um, that's uh, basically my last uh, slide, uh, mathematical slide that, that uh, we, we want to show where canonical maps come from uh, in, in the category sets. And then uh, that generalizes to concrete categories. And uh, that in, in abstract categories, you're, you're given, uh, you know, you say the category has products or core products, and then that means you've got canonical maps given along with the product or co-product. And then, then it's easy, then they just combine to give you other canonical maps to give you the, you know, the pushback or pullback or something, push out or pullback. And uh, <clears throat> so what I've tried to do here is to just to go back to the most basic Ur category of sets and analyze all these concepts using these two basic notions of elements and distinctions. So uh, that's basically the talk. How are we doing? Thank you. Questions? I might have a question. Um, so <clears throat> is it clear um, that not every map is a canonical map in this analysis? Not so. So ca can you now have a distinguish between between arbitrary maps and, and canonical maps, like special maps, or, or is just every map a canonical map? Well, you mean arbitrary map in sets? Yes. Because How would they be canonical? You, you can always find some co-limit that, um, that that map is the unique map defined using a universal property. But you have to switch things up to isomorphism to do that, right? Um, no, I don't think so. Huh? Um, so, for example, you take the uh, the diagram, which is uh, just the codomain of the map, and then you use your map to map somewhere, and then uh, you take the uh, the co-limit will be just the the domain again, and the a unique map that makes a triangle commute is the map itself. Well, you have the epi mono 
uh, factorization of every map too. And, and that gives you every map as a composition of two canonical maps. Yes. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's part of the theory, I think. Okay. When, you, when you do the epimono uh, factorization, you show where each one comes from. Mm -hmm. And if you sort of generate some universal construction, then it, it will, again, I would say go back to the two partial order defined morphisms. But I, but I think that's handled the easiest way by just doing the epimodal factorization. So canonical maps are not closed in their composition? They're what? They're, they, are, they are not closed in their composition? They are. Ah, they are, OK. Yeah. But, but then everything is canonical because everything factors is epimono, canonical epi, canonical mono. Yeah, I mean, every, every definition starts with certain data. And so it's what's canonical relative to that data. That's a good point, yes, yes. And so you're given, you know, the universal mapping property is given the cone or given the co-cone, what's the canonical map? Ah, okay, it's so given, given a function, what's the epimono factorization? Yeah. So given a function f, that function is canonical because you can, con <laughs> that's, not, that's not much of an insight then, right? But do you think- It has that, a canonical factorization. Huh. That's the insight. Okay. My question. There are various um, notions of uh, canonicity um, summarized in programming languages and computer science. So one good test that you can subject any notion of canonicity to is that people would usually say, if I say, oh, I have an arbitrary set A and I know nothing about it. What are some maps from A to A? And then the answer should be just, well, it has to be the identity because we don't know anything else about the set A. So then this can be formalized in various shapes or forms saying that, you know, the only polymorphic map, uh, polymorphic in A, parametrically polymorphic in A or, or natural or whatnot, people then have various notions which would restrict down so that you do get the answer that for an arbitrary unspecified A, the only, the only canonical map is the identity. Can, can you perform a similar analysis here? I have no idea. <laughs> the, I mean, that was the, the uh, Jean-Pierre's you know, original uh, intuitive definition was like that, that, that um, it's a map without any arbitrary decision. And so that's like what you said, if given a, what's a map that can be defined without arbitrary decisions between A and A. And, and uh, so in the context of category of sets, the theory is that given the data, the resulting canonical maps are arise out of these two underlying lattices. Right, so here somehow A is not specific, it's not a specific A that's given as data. We want to, we want A to be parameter or arbitrary or somehow not we are not allowed to do anything specific with respect to A, right? Yeah. Back to the similar question as what you have on the slide where it says without any arbitrary decision in this case, relative to A, right? Right, right, relative to A. Yeah, yeah it's always relative to the given data. So that's, yeah. Anybody want to see my philosophical slides or? Sure. Yes, please. <laughs> Tempting. You know, I'm a philosopher too, so I can. Are you hiding them because you are ashamed of them, or because you're so proud of them? Well, no, because mathematicians are often not interested in, in I see. the philosophical side. So here oh, you that... forget about being a mathematician and become more a general philosopher. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so it's the appendix, speculating, concluding remarks. And, and uh, so we have these two notions, um, elements and distinctions, and we've shown how they uh, combine and interweave to define morphisms, duality, universal constructions, and uh, then you abstract category theory. So 
what what is do they have some broader philosophical significance and uh, the conjecture is if you go back to Greek uh, even even Greek or more recent uh, philosophy you have this uh, duality between matter and form matter sometimes called substance in, in uh, as an Aristotle form as an information and uh, so the idea here is is that the idea here is that matter, the basic idea of, of the elements uh, make up matter and the basic idea of form is that distinctions make up information. And so you can analyze these two things in terms of elements and distinctions. So <clears throat> here I've got the two lattices on a three element set, lattice of subsets and the lattice of partitions. And so let's now, uh, move from the bottom to the top in each of these lattices. So we start out with the empty set. So that would be the set of no elements, no substance, no matter. And, and uh, as you move up, you increase the matter, the substance. As you go up until you get the, the universe, this is the three element uh, universe. So but as these elements come in, they are perfectly well defined. There's no, they're not indefinite as yet, and or at all. Uh, and so the whole thing that increases here is substance. Form is always constant. You're, there's no new information. A doesn't become uh, any more di distinct. It's perfectly distinct here. And, and then you've got all the distinct elements created. But if you go to the other lattice here you start with the, the indistinct partition where everything is blobbed together. So in some sense, all the matter exists, but it's all totally symmetrical or blobbed together. It's not distinguished at all. And as you move up, then things become more distinct. So as you move from here to here, say A and B are still indistinct, but here you have C is now distinct from A or B until you get to the top, where now everything's distinguished. But there are no new elements. All the elements are already here. So matter doesn't change. It just becomes more indistinct. I mean, excuse me, more distinct as you move up here. So here we have two creation stories. We have a creation story that starts with nothing and creates matter as you go up to the top to get your universe where the matter is always distinct. Here we have a creation story where you start, all the matter exists, but it's totally indistinct, blobbed together and becomes more and more distinct. <clears throat> so then I just sort of spell this out here. Yeah, two, two dual creation stories. So one creation story starts with elements fully for, uh, created out of nothing. The other creation story starts with all the elements, but it's a story of creating distinctions. In other words, you start with a totally undifferentiated matter, and then in some big bang, start making distinctions. In other words, break symmetries and that gives form to the matter. Does that ring any bells? <laughs> so this, this is in fact the big bang story is that you had perfect symmetry in, in the beginning state of the big bang and then what we had was this breaking of symmetries to create the universe which we have now. But there was no creation of energy. Energy is the substance here. The, and uh, so you had creation of energy, but it became more and more distinct as symmetries were broken. And that's the, so in some sense, this philosophical story about the lattice partitions actually connects at a very philosophical level to the Big Bang story of, of creation. Not to this, so matter was not created out of nothing. You had undifferentiated, perfectly symmetric energy, which then all sorts of symmetries were broken to give us the universe we have now. And, uh, and then you have the, the uh, quantitative version uh, going up where you increase probabilities and the quantitative version is, is uh, more and more information is created more and more things are distinguished. So we, we see the, the matter versus form, form being basically to end formation. 
And that is my last slide. <laughs> there. Thank you. So that's some, some wild generalizations. And, and uh, of course, if you, if you go into the physics of all this, you will see that, that there is all the symmetry breaking that creates the different forms of particles and everything we have now in the sort of Big Bang story. So I thought that was interesting to hang on that, although it's not, now it's just philosophical, not mathematical. So for now, this is the story. So there's more, more detail in the paper. You can download from the website. Uh, I go into some examples, uh, not, not only more, more uh, you know, in more general limits and co-limits, but also in a case uh, Jean-Pierre suggested a special type of category and uh, where one is a null object and, and, uh, and then everything works there as well. It's always given the data, what is then canonical constructions, uh, product, co product limits, co-limits and, and their universal mapping properties. So that's it. Thank you. Any other questions? Are the philosophical speculations also in the paper? I think they are. <laughs> okay, cool. They, uh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, the paper submitted to journal. We'll see. Um, we'll see what where it comes out finally. But the, I mean the. The bigger story here is is that, and I, I don't know if people agree, but but does everybody agree that category sets is somehow the Wooter category, and uh, things get abstracted from there? I mean, where where else does the turnaround arrows version of duality come from? And we see now it comes from where it comes from in category sets is interchanging elements and distinctions in the very definition of morphisms. Well, it looks like your analysis is not married to a very specific notion of set, actually, right? So, um, for instance, it seems that the thing that's important is that the lattices are complete, but less so that they're Boolean, as far as I can tell, a lot of these arguments, I mean, you definitely rely on completeness in a couple of places, maybe just finitary completeness here, because you have finitary limits. Um, um, yeah, we don't, but we don't actually use any other constructions. We don't use the meat in the lattices. We only use the joints. Actually, the joint semi lattice would do. Right. So you don't even need, I mean, you don't need things like complements in the lattice here, right? Do you? You don't. No, no. So it's going to work more generally. So if somebody has some other slightly different notion of set as a fundamental concept, you know, maybe they call it type or space or something. Yeah. In, in many cases, I think this sort of thinking still applies. Yeah. Well, if, if you if you can find a mo another setting in which something acts like uh, elements and distinction, so you get this dual interplay, you could generate the whole thing out of that. Mm -hmm. You'd have a notion of duality built in. You you know, as long as you had this these uh, you know the, these uh, two joint semilattices actually is all you really need. And what, what's also interesting, of course, is, is that uh, the, the, uh, the lattice of partitions and the lattice of subsets were all known in the 19th century. And right. category theory wasn't developed until mid 20th century. And the other logical operations on partitions wasn't until the 21st century. But uh, so in some sense, these ideas were there all along, but just it took the category of sets and, and uh, all this lovely duality stuff in, in universal constructions and sets to really bring out, to me at least, the role of elements and distinctions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in various uh, topoi, you might find some other notions that would fit the role of elements and distinctions and then build up your home theory. And uh, the, 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 um, the notion of distinctions, I think, is also in constructive mathematics as the, um, what do they call it? The, a partners. Yeah, partners relation is, yeah. 
Yeah, no, my point is that you don't actually have to fight the fight of whether sets are fundamental here because different people will have different ideas. Uh -huh. But um, nevertheless, the, the, I think the approach spans several such ideas. So, you know, you don't, I mean, you presented it with sets and as you say, nothing, presumably nothing much would change if it was some slightly different notion. Um, uh, that could serve similar foundational uh, purposes as sets. Yeah. You know, slightly different sets. Yeah, if you're, you're thinking of some notion of constructivity or, or. Well, that's a possibility, definitely. But you could, like, for instance, I, I mean, sure, I, I, I'm pretty sure that if we just switch to a Boolean topos, absolutely nothing will break. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and so you can, you can, um, Types are maybe a little more interesting because they are, in essence, they typically tend to be very predicative. So there you, you would have to explore this idea that the lattices need not be complete, maybe, because that makes life easier then. I mean, right. there's, it's a, there is a certain commitment to having complete lattices in terms of foundations. Um, but as yeah. you point out, if you really just need the joint semi lattices for the finitary stuff, that's already a good sign. Yep. Okay. Uh, any other questions? We would normally discuss lunch at this point, and we would discover that we're getting burgers, but maybe some other day. <laughs> um, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to post this on the channel, and I'll send you an email um, where this is available. Right. Um, Next week, it seems like we are going to convince Jakas Mrekar to give us a seminar on spectral sequences for logicians. I wanted it to be called spectral sequences for dummies, but he's too civilized for that. Um, so spectral sequences for logicians, which would be interesting for anybody who wants to compute the fundamental group of a sphere in type theory. I'm looking at the person who is my top left corner, top right corner. Um, and uh, also, uh, if, any, if you can't sleep on February 8th, I'm giving a seminar on synthetic uh, computability in Wisconsin at 3.30 local, 3.30 p.m. local time. So that's 10.30 p.m. here. And it's on, my, uh, it's on my blog. There's an announcement with links and so on. You're actually going there? No, no, Zoom, of course, via Zoom. <laughs> Um, so it's I'll, I'll have to be I'll have to find a place where I can speak loudly at 10 30 p.m. So that's not my apartment because that would wake okay. up people. I gave this talk to Yonowski's uh, uh, category theory seminar in New York City, which starts uh -huh. at seven in the evening. Uh huh. Oh, oh yes, I remember you said that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's one o'clock in the morning, and that <laughs> that's worse. <laughs> Why do they have a seminar at seven in the evening? That's crazy New Yorkers. Yeah, if it's all by Zoom, it doesn't matter. Yeah, well, yes, I suppose so. Some of them actually work. Yep. All okay. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, David. I'll see you around. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you.